they come in. Assalamualaikum, folks. Uh, welcome. Um, just admitting everyone in. Um, we're expecting around 100 odd people. So just give us about a minute as I admit everyone in. Uh, we need to be starting very shortly. Okay, so we're going to start. Uh, we still got people in the waiting because I'm going to admit them as they come in. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome, brothers and sisters, to the Islamic Courses Zoom session titled Confidence and Leadership in Times of Crisis with Idris Khamisa, who's an international consultant in education and human development, and Ibrahim Rousseau, former ambassador to South Africa, both of them from uh, South Africa. Welcome, both of you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and Ramadan Kareem. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Right, welcome. So, Excellent. So um, just want to go quickly before I hand it over to our presenters, uh, just want to quickly get some housekeeping rules, please. Um, you're already on mute as you enter the session. So please keep your phones just in case on mute uh, or your PCs or whatever devices you're using. Please keep it on mute. It is being recorded. If you haven't registered, leave your email address on the chat and you'll receive a recorded copy of the session. Okay. Um, if you haven't uh, registered, uh, if you haven't registered, leave your email address on the chat, and we'll send you a copy. If you are registered, don't worry, we'll send you a thing. There is a Q and A session. Um, we will please write them on the chat, and we will also take questions directly from the Zoom as well. So it's very, very important um, that you do that. But at the same time, we would like people to um, <clears throat> uh, on. Uh, well, write the questions down as well. Right, okay, so Bismillah. So, you know, one of the reasons why we're doing this, there are moments that define leadership and managing through a global pandemic is certainly one of them, right? The coronavirus, will go through. on top of dealing with one's own personal fear and anxiety for watching around the world, you fall apart. You have the responsibility to guide others and make important decisions which will affect far more than your own. Right. With no manuals to follow, no protocols to set in place, no one is really truly prepared to cope with the circumstances which they could never anticipate. You really need to exhibit integrity, decisiveness, compassion, that every single individual can experience a sense of common purpose. To do that, you need to lead with confidence, right? Not just confidence with your own abilities, but confidence in others. Truth behold, no one knows how long this crisis will last. But it's an also an opportunity, what lives will be taken and what happens next. But, and, and we do know that a leader will continue to continue uh, need a great deal of consciousness to project deliberate calm and empathy and decisive action and communicate effectively through turbulent times. Very privileged and honored to have both Idris Hamisa, both South Africans, uh, uh, ironically, you know, I mean, this is quite strange. I'm in the UK in London and I'm dealing with South, two South Africans, which is quite interesting in itself. As everyone knows, Idris Hamisa is an international consultant in education, and human development, and conducted many numerous workshops across the world, Australia, US, Canada, UK, Middle East, Nigeria, all over South Africa to schools, businesses, and high net worth individuals. Ibrahim Rasul, as everyone knows, is, an ex, is the ex-South uh, African ambassador to the US, comrade of Nelson Mandela, founder of the World Foundation, uh, and Georgetown Senior Fellow. So without further ado, the structure of the event will be as follows. We're going to have um, a presentation, uh, 10 minutes from each speakers, and then we'll have some sort of conversation between the two, and we'll have some open Q&A. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to um, our Ustad, uh, Ibrahim Rasul. Bismillah, Ustad. Are you there? You should be there. You should be there. Let me just check. There might be some connection problem. Let's see if you can hear me. We might have just disconnected, but we'll just check. I think so, yeah. This might have, ah, there he is, yeah. Okay, so let me just bring it back again. Ah, there you are. I disappeared for a while. Yes, you did. Okay, Bismillah. So I've done the introductions, handing it over to you. Bismillah, Ibrahim. 
Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh and good afternoon, good evening wherever you may be. I think under the conditions of COVID-19 or the coronavirus with lockdown across the world with infections running out of control and with deaths steadily rising the world finds itself at a very interesting and important moment. And I was thinking of this moment in terms of the idea of rupture. Rupture as in a breach, a disturbance of what is usual and harmony. Rupture as a break with what has gone before, as a watershed, as a separation. And in thinking of this, I was reminded of Surah in Shikaq, the chapter in the Quran called the rapture, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, starts off, إِذَا السَّمَاءُ شَقَّتْ When the heavens have raptured and responds to its Lord as it must and continues, and when the earth is flattened out and casts out its content until it is empty, and responds to its Lord as it must. Verily, O people, you are toiling and laboring towards your Lord painfully and slowly, and you shall meet your Lord. Sadaqallahul Azim. Allah speaks the truth. That while this rapture that Allah refers to is on a broader scale, its micro application to life on earth today under the conditions of coronavirus is certainly one that calls out for a moment of leadership. Who will lead us through this rupture? Because rupture can be terrible for those who cling to the status quo, who hold on to the past, but rupture can be liberating and progressive for those who understand that the past is flawed, that what we are existing with is founded on fragility and often inertia. We are neither moving forward nor going back. It's a moment of stasis. We have come to a halt. And it is even a moment signifying regression. We have gone backwards. We are further away than our predecessors, either as human beings or as the ummah may have been. And therefore, when the world is leveled out, it's emptied its useless and irrelevant content, the sky's secrets await for us out of the rapture. There's a new relationship that awaits for us vertically with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and horizontally with fellow human beings across the world. And the ummah needs leadership at this moment to navigate this rapture so that at least the last hundred years of inertia or regression gives rise to a transitional moment in which we are freed from the occupation and authoritarianism that governs our home, our heartlands of Islam, the Islamophobia and oppression that governs much of the Muslim minority world and many of the ordinary citizens of the world, where the Ummah has the lowest literacy levels in the world today, where we have the lowest number of scientific publications, we have an aversion to art, and we certainly are displaced from science, and we have the lowest number of patents that we register in the world today, whether for technology or whatever else. And that brings us to the question, what leadership can COVID-19 produce, and what are the conditions under which this leadership must be produced? COVID-19, just a few weeks into it, has already broadened the definition of ilm of knowledge. Up till now, we have bowed to clerical knowledge, only to theological or even fiqhi knowledge of jurisprudence. What is going to be produced out of this in terms of leadership is a knowledge that has to say, here are the scientists who are helping us through this pandemic. Here are the medical personnel who are helping us through this pandemic. Here are the political leadership that's helping us through this pandemic. And so, Professions are coming into their own, actuaries are coming into their own. And so leadership is no longer the monopoly of a single group of people who study 
at the seminary or at the madrasa or the Darul Uloom. Leadership is now broadened out and incorporates many, many other disciplines. The second thing is, if leadership is broadened out because it admits other um, disciplines, then theology is being democratized. When the masajid are closed and we're all confined to our homes and we're in the midst of Ramadan, suddenly we are leading the tarawih in our homes. We are preparing to lead the Eid Salah in our homes. And so, um, in, in, in a sense, it reminds me of the revolution that was happening in the late 70s, early 80s, where the Quran was democratized. Up till then, we were only learning the Quran from the mimbar. Suddenly, the translations of the Quran became available. We read the Quran, and in much the same way, theology is being democratized in a sense, and we are now beginning to discern spirituality from rituality. And so, all in all, I think that we are going to get this kind of leadership. The third one is that we are being reminded in terms of our need for social justice. At this point, we have never needed more a combination of grassroots leadership and global leadership. Because what COVID-19 has taught us, that we can no longer simply be countries. We can no longer simply be localities. We've got to think globally because the challenges that we are facing don't know boundaries. It's COVID-19 today. It's been for the last decade or so. It's been climate change. It's been for the last few decades, the phenomenon of terror that has respected no boundaries. And therefore, global leadership is critical, but local action is absolutely crucial. So the social justice di dimension that comes into play is absolutely crucial. But we've got to have a systemic break with the kind of um, leadership challenges that we face. We can't go back to the old binaries. Will the world be better off with capitalism or socialism? Somehow the ummah has to have leadership that is able to say, what are the maqasid of Islam? What are the intents of Islam? Egalitarianism, justice, mercy, etc., etc. And how do we build that into something without necessarily accepting the assumptions of the binaries that we have inherited? And that's what leadership needs to be able to do to rescue the, 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 the objectives, the principles, the values, and be prepared to say, we can manage without some of these forms that we've inherited. That means that leadership has to appreciate nuance. Nothing is black and white anymore. There's no longer Muslim, non-Muslim. It's now humanity. There's no longer Shia, um, Sunni. It has to be who says La ilaha illallah. And so we need to be able to have leadership that appreciates nuance. It's le strategic leadership that understands the relationship between in-reach and outreach. We can't have a world in which we are fragmented as an ummah and we want people to believe that we are going to be tolerant with them because they are Christian uh, or whatever the case may be. If they see us being harsh with Shias, why would they believe that we would be loving with Christians, with Jews, with Hindus, with atheists, if we can't be loving with someone else who says, la ilaha. So that's the inreach we have to do, as well as the outreach, because now the world is available. And my last two points is that we're going to need leadership with courage. And I use courage in the Kantian sense of the word, where the opposite of cowardice is not courage. The opposite of cowardice is recklessness, adventurism. We have seen part of the problem that we're facing is that we have either been cowards or we have been reckless extremists. Courage is the perfect middle. It's to stand up against cowardice that overlooks social justice issues, overlooks matters of truth. But we also have to have the courage to say to those who in our name do suicide bombings, do terror and all of those kind of things to say, you are not acting in our names and we need to defeat you. And finally, all of this is premised on leadership that is based on self-purification. 
every leader, every prophetic leader emerged in Islam out of a period of solitude, of silence, of isolation. The Prophet Sallallahu in the cave of Hira, Nabi Musa exiting Egypt and going into the desert, Nabi Yunus learning patience in the belly of the whale. We need to be able to do that, to see our own faults, cast them out, see our own egos that get in the way and cast that out so that our ambitions, our vengefulness, our hatreds, and our over-compassion for some, and our over-identification with those who look like us, pray like us, eat like us, don't get in the way that we are able to be fair. And so, Nizan, I thought that I wanted to use this 10 minutes simply to sketch out some of these um, broad issues and then look forward to the discussion as they emerge, inshallah. Fantastic, um, Ustad. Uh, Ibrahim, that was from, that's very inspiring, uh, and you've given an overarching um, uh, thought of leadership, where we should be going, and 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 so now, I'm going to go to Sidi Idris now, and and as an international educational consultant and human capacity uh, consultant. So, I mean, you've been running workshops for decades all around the world, and obviously not only in leadership but confidence. What does it mean in real terms? So. I mean, we want to get your thoughts and for the next 10 minutes and, and, and practicalities. It's all great talking about being great leaders and so on. So how do we practically get on with the nitty gritty bit of building leadership? Bismillah. <clears throat> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And uh, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. <clears throat> uh, for me, uh, you know, uh, Ibrahim Jazakumullah always is a joy to listen to you. For me, when people ask me about what is happening around us, and uh, one of my recurring opening statements have been on the recent past, that the Ummah is bleeding. We are in a mess. We often bask about our past glory, but what about today? And we have a tendency to blame other people for the situation we are. And I want to encourage, inshallah, that we take ownership of our life, that we ourselves have the potential to lead, uh, to lead with compassion, with love, and uh, to be inclusive in the way we do things. It saddens me that when I look around us today, many of us have become spectators. We become passive receptacles. We become consumers rather than uh, producers. And in the work that I do, in terms of schools, families, and societal issues, I just find that the collective self-esteem of the Ummah is diminishing. It is diminishing for a number of reasons. The one critical reason is that we have forfeited the first eye in the Quran, Ikra. Many of us are inarticulate. We do not even know our deen. We cannot even defend our deen. And the other important aspect is this, that we have become very, very self-absorbed. And I want to reinforce the point that Brother Ibrahim made. The whole idea, as my friend, may Allah grant Fuad Nadi, as you know, Dental Fridos, he often speaks about uh, convergence rather than conversion. The whole idea that we are part of a collective humanity and our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came as a mercy onto all mankind. And I think the whole idea of a blame syndrome is something we need to relegate to the back burner. And what we need to do, we need to ask ourselves, who is leading you? How is he leading you? Do you subscribe uh, to his views? Do you stand up to what he's saying? And throughout the Quran, we are told to question, to reflect, and so on and so forth. And suddenly, Sadly, it is the vociferous minority who have such great sway, as it were, that the people who follow them appear to be far more bellicose in many ways. And for me, this corona COVID thing is a sudden, harsh, emphatic reality. It is a question Allah is asking all of us. Where have you been? Have you forgotten me? Have you forgotten that I'm in charge of this world? It is also painful though it is that you lose your loved ones. Painful though it is, many people are going through depression and anxiety, the concern about the work, but it is a new wealth, a new reality. It is a gift for us to reflect. 
as Ibrahim said, reflect on our horizontal and vertical relationships, reflect on ourselves, and we are very, very sad thing for me that at the end of the lockdown, we are no different. We came out unscathed from it. Then in which world are you living in? How can you blithely ignore this? So I'm hoping, inshallah, that through the lockdown, we begin to rekindle our love for the Quran, a rekindle for knowledge, a rekindle for the love of reading. We rekindle our passion for our home, that we make our homes no more dysfunctional. They become a, a haven, a, a site of happiness, rather than a site of contestation and struggle. That in our schools, we provide holistic education, not like what Mark Twain said, that his education was interrupted by schooling that we need to provide that holistic education so that, so that the, the I, I don't mean to use word products, so the charges from the schools become ambassadors uh, for humanity. They have compassion, they are authentic, they are creative, and so that they fulfill this noble, noble uh, responsibility. And it does not require you to be a rocket scientist to understand that the situation the Ummah is very, very low. It's very, very low. We have become, sadly, a bunch of complainers. We blame everyone else. We do not reflect on ourselves. That the man at home is uh, no more the Amir or the uh, mother, the Amira, he has become emasculated. He does not assert himself anymore. So I think what needs to be done is that as individuals, we need to ensure that the world that we live behind is a better world. That people look at and say to us that Alhamdulillah, it is through them we realize that we cannot sit there passively and expect things to be done. We need to take ownership because what the world is lacking is indeed compassionate, caring, authentic leadership. A leadership that is not pedantic and lives in textbooks, but a leadership that is uh, progressive, it is sensitive, he understands a particular context. You know, I remember reading this somewhere and I think it's very, very powerful. It says, if you teach children how you were taught, you rob them of their tomorrow. And I think it's important for us as a collective to say to ourselves, enough is enough. Of course, it's about Tazkiyah, your self purification. It's about us, inshallah, treading this path, this new trajectory with confidence, with enthusiasm, and to ensure that we leave no people behind us so that Muslims are no more the subject of ridicule because we have become our own worst enemies. But they are subject of inspiration, a sub, a individuals that can really extricate the Ummah from this quagmire so that we are able to do what we're supposed to do supposed to soar like eagles, carry others with us, and open a world to people that is there. But we have hidden Islam from other people because of our own decadalos, our own shortcomings, as it were. So I think, you know, I'm hoping, inshallah, through the discussion, we'll discuss uh, other uh, practical aspects. But I can tell you that the humanity, forget the Ummah, is crying out for dynamic leadership a leadership that inspires and not a leadership that tramples over everyone else. Thank you so much, uh, Sidi Dries. And I just want to reconcur what you said about um, Sidi Fuad, rahmatullah who died uh, recently. He was, without a doubt, one of the leaders of the Muslim world who will cherish to come. Um, and, and everyone should do a fatiha in their own time if they can. Okay, so we're going to open, before we open up, just want to get some questions uh, between you, uh, just some thoughts and reflections on amongst yourselves, uh, amongst Ibrahim and, and, and Sidi Idris. You know, are, are there any interaction, thoughts and reflections you want to uh, 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 concur with yourselves before we get into the questions, questions and answers? I mean, you, you know, I mean, you talked about, you, you mentioned many things in your, in your things, uh, in your, um, um, in your lecture about uh, emotional intelligence uh, and many other things. Um, I just want to start off with some questions about what, in, what got you into this whole, what inspired you, Idris? You know, do you have a story to tell? You know, um, <laughs> if I have a story to tell, it takes a whole hour. But anyway, I, just, uh, I would just share with you uh, uh, two things that happened, right? And uh, it's again, you know, what uh, they say a teacher 
is not a sage on the stage, but a guy on the side. And I was a, a naughty boy, but uh, not disrespectful. And uh, when I was in uh, grade 10, standard 8, and I had a teacher uh, of English who used to really laugh at the mistakes I made in my composition. And I used to <laughs> laugh it out. <laughs> so funny, sir. Unbeknown to him that I used to cry myself to sleep. And I could not share that with my dad because my dad uh, made it very clear to the teachers, the flesh is yours, the bones are mine. But the next year, I had another teacher, Smile Katrada. Uh, Ibrahim, you might know him, Ibrahim. Uh, Smile Katrada, uh, who was in Cape Town. And he was my father's friend. And I remember sitting at the back of the class. We were doing a poem, God's Grand Year by Hopkins. At that time, I made up my mind, I'm useless. I'm not good in English. The teacher told me this. And next to me was a, 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 a curvaceous damsel, Indira. I was pulling her hair, pinching her cheeks, and everything else. And then the teacher noticed I wasn't paying attention. So he said to me, Idris, you're a naughty boy. I said, no. He said, well, I'm not leaving the class until you give me your interpretation of the last two lines of this poem. And he said, if you do not give it to me, I'll give you the cold shoulder. Do you want the cold shoulder from me? I said, no, I do not want it. Anyway, I responded just to get him off my back. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize that the answer, uh, uh, he loved it so much. He told the class, you know what, I just love his answer. It's such a beautiful answer. Idris, why don't you give yourself a chance? That was a warm wow moment for me. From that day onwards, I began to take an active interest. I became an avid reader and I began to speak in public. And the whole world is open to me, right, to all of us. And this is what we need to do. We need to develop young people that mm -hmm. are confident, who are articulate, who love the deen of Islam, who love humanity. And we need to do that. We don't do that. We speak down upon them. We don't give them an opportunity. In fact, we stifle them. That's one of the many stories and, anyway. And, and is that why you think there is a death in dynamic leadership in the Ummah today? Yes, I think- Micro it, level and a mi macro. Because you deal, you deal with a lot of micro level stuff. You train people, you build people, uh, build confidence. You coach people. These are some of your uh, workshops you do all around the world, right? Yes. You know, one of the things that uh, I found is that, uh, you know, in many of our institutions, uh, children are expected uh, to be passive, do nothing, just listen to the teacher. Hazrat Umar uh, reminded us that 50% of knowledge comes from good questions. And we need to get our students to ask those questions. You know, there is someone who won the Nobel Prize for uh, one of the sciences. So they asked him, to what do you attribute your success? He said, I attribute it to my mother. So how come your mother? He said, well, my mother used to ask me every day what good question you ask today. So we need to encourage students to ask questions, they, you know, to contribute. And they, we need to do that. And the other critical thing that we have done is that we have killed creativity in our schools. There was a lovely study that was done that uh, studied children between the ages of four and five and they tested them for the creativity. 98% tested creative geniuses. The same kids at the age of uh, nine and 10, the percentage went down to 32%. The same children at the age of 14 and 15 went down to 12%. And the adults were tested. So the whole idea is we need to encourage our children uh, to be creative. We ourselves must be creative. And our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself was creative. Creativity is a part of who we are. We are people that are solution driven. We are not people who sit back, moan and groan. So I think uh, what needs to be done, our homes need to be transformed. Our schools need to be transformed. The kind of lectures given uh, need uh, to be different, need to be encouraging, need to be participatory, so that what happens is the people that leave those institutions feel confident enough and feel empowered enough to participate in. Fantastic. Um, we're going to come back to you because I think you're going to break your fast right now, isn't it? Um, yes. Okay, inshallah. We're going to come back to you and then you're going to rejoin us again. Okay, so Ibrahim, um, you, as a diplomat, as a senior diplomat, as ambassador to, uh, of South Africa to uh, the US, you've seen, you've seen at, a, at a very high level uh, the leadership we have around the Muslim world. Um, I, I want your thoughts and uh, I, we, I, we want to open up your questions. What do you feel, you know, um, 
How, what do you feel about the leadership in the current state? I mean, is it is, is the problem we've got full of old age pensioners or what, what is it? What seems to be the problem with the Muslim world leadership at the moment? I know you mentioned some things, but and we're going to open up for questions and answers as well now. Hmm. You know, give us some give us some insights. You you've dealt you've been an ambassador for how many years? It was four and a half years in Washington. Right. Okay. So you've dealt with everybody essentially. Yeah, but I think that those were not the defining moments of leadership. I think, and I and I want to say that you can be called a leader, and you can see Nuruddin Lemu on on the on the on the on the, on the group, and you can still feel intimidated. Yes, so, yes, Sheikh Nuruddin Lemu from Nigeria, Asia. I'm going to bring him at some point. And we've got some amazing folks around the world as well. We've got yeah, Abdurrahman yeah. Malik and we've got Bilal uh, from the UK. Abdurrahman yeah. is in the US. Yalla, bismillah. So, yeah. okay. But you see, I think the defining moments of leadership are in times of danger when you don't seek leadership. Yeah. You know, for me, leadership is exercised between two ahadith. The one that says, where the Prophet ﷺ says, whenever there's more than one of you on a mission, the first job you do is choose an Amir, find a leader. So there can never be a leadership vacuum. The other one says, whoever desires leadership must be denied leadership. So don't put yourself out for leadership. So between those two ahadith, prophetic traditions, you have to find a formula for leadership. You can't leave a vacuum and you can't be over ambitious in your desire for leadership because then you've lost the cause. And in South Africa, we have this enormous habit of producing accidental leaders. You go to school one day in Santa Six, the 1976 school boycotts break out, your class needs leadership. And suddenly you're thrust in the front lines. But that's that's all over the ummah, isn't it? We're damage. We're always doing damage limitations and damage recovery. Always reacting. I think there's a difference between doing damage control mm -hmm. and stepping into a vacuum and giving leadership as it is required. So throughout South Africa, given the phenomenon of apartheid, Nelson Mandela had other ideas about what his life should be. Mm -hmm. He turned out to be a leader of the ANC, a prisoner, and then the president. Right. I only wanted to play rugby at high school right. and aspire to playing provincial rugby. I ended up going to jail um, rather than that. I gave up on that. Mm -hmm. So the fact of the matter is that there is leadership that sacrifices mm -hmm. and leadership that benefits. Alhamdulillah. And if we can distinguish between the two, then inshallah, I think we are on the right path. And so, in a sense, there are leaders and then there are managers. Right. When I encountered, for example, Barack Obama, mm -hmm. he was elected in 2008 on a, the world was in recession, there was a global recession. He inspired leadership, yes we can. And I think he made a mistake that a South African president made. He inspired leadership when he was elected, he became a manager and was risk averse. Right. And so, so, so we've got to, that's the second nuance we've got to, 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 to manage. When are you a manager and when are you a leader? Okay, excellent. And then I think um, just thirdly, mm -hmm. It's to be in touch with yourself, not to take yourself too seriously, mm -hmm. to know that you are just part of a relay race. It is when you think that you are in your own 100 meter sprint mm -hmm. and that the glory is all yours, that you make those kind of mistakes. When you think that someone has run before you and you've got to give the baton to someone who will follow you, it, you, it, it creates the sense of humility. And then you do what you can while you have the baton and you push yourself as much as what you can. And I think that that is what is lacking in the, in the ummah. Right. I think we have made leadership a function of eight years of studies at the seminary, the ability to speak Arabic, the ability to memorize 10,000 ahadith, all very good and laudable. So the mullahs are to blame, right? What you're it, saying. It's not sufficient. Right. It plays a role, but it is not sufficient. 
it is divorced from other disciplines. It is divorced from society. It is divorced from the struggle for social justice. If it was not young people in South Africa, in the Muslim community, who mm -hmm. went out and fought apartheid, young Muslims, mm -hmm. the clerical leadership would have made us a despised community in South Africa when freedom came. The young people made sure that the ummah was held high because a few substituted for the many. A few made enough noise to overwhelm the silence of the many. The few made enough sacrifices, died on the streets, um, went to jail and suffered hardships to compensate for the silence of the many. Amazing. And so there are many sectional leaders, but not too many comprehensive leaders that the Ummah has. And that's part of those statistics that I spoke about at the beginning and the need for this moment of rupture mm -hmm. that I think we are, we are faced with. Fantastic. Okay, we're going to take some questions. We've got an international audience, folks from the US, to, from Indonesia, Malaysia, Bangladesh. I'm going to take a question from uh, Ashfaq Zaman, who's from Bangladesh. Bismillah, Ashfaq. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, really nice insight from both the speakers. So my question and comment is directed towards uh, Brother Ibrahim Rasul. Uh, he mentioned about the aspects of globalization. Uh, now that is not the time to think within borders. Uh, but the reality, if you really analyze the reality on the ground, is that most countries post-COVID or during the COVID are adopting strategies which are uh, focused predominantly on their own country. Uh, we can see the U.S. at first, Brexit, uh, Italy, all the countries, they're like making strategies. They're totally focused on the level that they're banning the export-import of uh, medical equipments as well in some cases. So do you think that this is a perfect op opportunity to showcase the world the beauty of Islamic chivalry uh, inspired by our Prophet Musa Sallam and our Sahabas. Can the Muslim leadership truly showcase the essence of our faith by being more inclusive and sort of devising solutions for the whole world and uh, not only within this uh, Islamic region? Fantastic. Thank you, Ashfaq. Ashfaq represents Siyako, which is a pan um, uh, organization of, uh, of uh, Mus uh, uh, countries around Bangladesh, Bhutan, Malaysia, uh, Burma, mm -hmm. and so on. So, yeah, Bismillah. Thank you. Just, just, just very quickly, there's a difference between global leadership and globalization. I believe that the direction of globalization has been partially to blame and it needs, and this rupture that COVID-19 hopefully delivers can, 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 can reorient a global leadership. Secondly, we are running the world on the old principles of international leadership where nations need to compete with each other negotiate with each other. And that's what the United Nations is about. It's a collection of individual nations negotiating what's the best way forward. Climate change, um, terror, and now COVID-19 shows that the international model is not sufficient. We've got to shift to global governance on the key issues that respect no borders. I'm not saying take, I'm not saying take over everything that moves in the world, because then I think we create another tyranny. But certainly there are issues that require global governance and we are saddled with international governance. And that's what the rupture needs to shift in terms of that also. Can Islam rise and shine? I'm encouraged by the fact that in some countries, Western countries, they have put the ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu on bus stations, on buses, on trains and so forth, about washing your hands, about, um, about sneezing and covering, et cetera, et cetera. So aspects of our deen are, are being valued. Hopefully, it, I also think that we are not going to go through our grand ideas, but through our service on the ground. The fact that in the UK, of the first doctors who succumbed to coronavirus and died, four of them at least, according to my knowledge, were, were Muslim doctors at the coalface making sacrifice. Don't go for the grand gestures, go for the service. I think we are distinguishing ourselves in South Africa, for example, by a Muslim, a number of Muslim philanthropies that are at the coalface giving food, giving healthcare, drilling for water, etc. You see, what we are, the phase we're in now as an ummah is what I would call the Meccan phase. Mm -hmm. You see, 
in this phase, the Prophet وسلم, before he was Rasulullah, the messenger of Allah, he was al amin the trustworthy. You see, trust precedes the reception of the message. If you simply think we are an ummah with a message, let's do da'wah, let's go and tell the world how great we are, and we have not won the world's trust, and we have a residue, a strong residue of fear for what is done in our name and that we have been silent about, then I think our message gets lost in the, in the whole atmosphere of fearfulness about us, derision about us, and, 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 and therefore I think we've got to do the humble things. Let's be al amin before we enter the phase of Risala, of giving the message. Okay, I've got someone from, uh, I've got Mufti Sajjad Hussain from Diyaban. He's one of the managements of the Darul of Diyaban. So Mufti Sajjad, go ahead, Bismillah. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, uh, I want to extend my thanks to both the speakers. They contributed a lot of good ideas we can implement in our life. My question is uh, to uh, Sheikh Idris, that uh, in Madaris, how we can build uh, the confidence and uh, the dynamicism and uh, how we can make the graduates of Madrasa to communicate with the community and they can convey the message of Islam and they can uh, talk to the global community. We are teaching uh, in Madrasa the, the students, but the big problem is that they are quite uh, confident when they are uh, having debate uh, in the boundary of Madrasa, but when they are coming out, so they, uh, they fail to com uh, convey the message of Islam as they are required. And also the community uh, distance uh, themselves uh, from the madrasa background. So these are the faults and deficits that I am observing here. So what is your suggestion on how we can curb these uh, problems? This is for uh, Sidi Idris and you're, you're quoting from Diaband, uh, from uh, Darul Ulum Diaband in India and the leadership crisis of the Muslims in India as well. Yeah. So Idris, Bismillah. Yeah, I think uh, there are a few things that uh, we need to bear in mind. Uh, it is not enough for us uh, to teach the children the what and how of Islam, must also teach them the why of Islam, why they do what they do. And it is, uh, this is an important aspect, especially if they're growing up in a plural society. Uh, people of other faiths ask them, why do you do this? Many of them do not have the confidence. There is a friend of mine who did a study uh, uh, about uh, the children who left uh, madrasas or left the Muslim schools. And he said there are four types of uh, products. The one is, he says that individual that has an intellectual understanding of Islam and he has a passion. There is another, neither has the passion or the intellectual. The other one who has the passion, not the intellectual, and other one has both. So it's very, very important that we're able to respond to the questions. And even when you are debating, which is a, one, it's a wonderful uh, uh, co-curricular, extracurricular activity, it's important that we are debating about real issues that our children should be able at the uh, madrasa level to ask those questions. And then we need to engage them in uh, the real world. And I think it's also important, it's critical, that you know the parents of these children should also be educated, informed. In the end, information must lead to transformation. And once you build up the confidence, and inshallah it will come right, I think you are in the right lines. I think you need to uh, persist with it and also engage with your children. One of the things I often say to people, allow children to determine the curriculum lest the curriculum determines them. Try to get feedback uh, from uh, your students, what they do they feel, so that inshallah they'll become ambassadors for the Dean of Islam. Maybe you can go to India and do some workshops there. Go to the, <laughs> okay. You know, go to... No, do you think the management... <laughs> You are, you are, you are most welcome here. If you're coming, and you are uh, having this course, so definitely they will get a lot and lot from the side. And one question, just one minute. And uh, here, uh, the students are following the Islamic curriculum. They are uh, studying the hadith explanation and commentary, all these things. But uh, what is the point where they are lacking? Is that 
when the time comes uh, to communicate with the school backgrounds and uh, also the uh, uh, modern uh, modern uh, educated people so at the time they are not able to uh, to 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 give, to give the message they want to give them that is the problem with us and when we are discussing about the modern issues and modern problems of the muslim community so we don't have in our syllabus or in our curriculum that we can teach them just we are teaching islamic ethos islamic uh, uh, guidance but we are not teaching about the world about the affairs but okay. as a, uh, as per a muslim as, as per a muslim leader he should be uh, fully aware of, uh, about the uh, world affairs so that uh, he can uh, come up with the good solution so okay, i just have uh, sorry I just got one last suggestion here. Yeah, I mean, we can go on talking about this. The critical thing is, you know, is allow your students, ask them what would you like us to include in the curriculum. Look at the experiential world of children. What are the challenges they are going through? And in that way, inshallah, you know, uh, uh, you know the fact that you're asking the question, I think it's a, it's a positive sign. And inshallah, you'll get there. Do not give up. Try to seek help. And in whatever way I can support uh, your institution, I'll be happy to do that. Invite him down, Thank Mufti Sajjad, to from Dirban to uh, you, maybe you can take a trip to South Africa, or you can get Sidi Dries to go to India. Right now, you need the leadership, especially with Modi uh, doing his usual uh, sad tactics. Okay, so uh, Ibrahim, any thoughts? Um, we've got we've got a comment come through, and I think it's a very important one from Humaira Khan. The leadership of the future requires men and women to work collectively. Uh, to, to work together collaboratively. How do you see this happening? How do you see the shifting from the current extremely chauvinistic leadership, uh, especially, and that's a lot of, let's be honest, there is a lot of chauvinism in the Muslim world, uh, especially when it comes to leadership. And let's be honest, as someone active in the Muslim community, sometimes I feel that the women can do a better job than our men, uh, but, I'm, but maybe I'm wrong. So Bismillah. Yeah, no, look, I think that that's absolutely important and that's going to be part of the condition of the rupture in South Africa when a group of almost extreme ultra-orthodox people wanted to take the government to court. They pleaded all kinds of kav, of spiritual um, poverty, spiritual vacuum that would happen if they can't go to the mosque and they exhorted why the mosques are so powerful for them and to experience community, to experience connectedness. And the simple question on which they failed is, if it is so powerful, then why have you stopped women from coming to the mosque? And this was in a court case that was beamed across the country. And suddenly we were caught, not literally, with our pants down, because there is no consistency. What we claim for ourselves, we don't claim for others. What we claim for men in Islam, we don't claim for women in Islam, and that is where the nifaq, the hypocrisy, became apparent to the world because everyone said, yes, this is true. If this is a mosque is so valuable, why have you stopped women from going? So I think that what has happened in this moment of rapture is that we are forced to do tarawih at home, and suddenly the whole family needs to be part of the jama. Suddenly we are having nasihas from our, from our, 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 our wives, to our children as well. We're all studying that. We are going to need them for the Jamaat on Eide um, and, 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 and so forth. So I think if we can salvage out of this moment of rapture, a pushback for misogyny, because sometimes it's chauvinism, sometimes it's misogyny. And on that scale, we need to push back completely. I think we are going to need to be able to now find since um, theology is being democratized and we've got to make sure that it's done in a way that adheres to the maqasid, the intents of Islam and the Sharia but with the freedom so that every Muslim can see themselves in this theology that is emerging. It's not a theology for men, it's a theology for all. I think um, it's, it's really recovering a whole lot of things that is, that is possible. But this is the time. And so for the first time, because it's online, mm -hmm. you are having masajid on Fridays, allowing, because it's not a khutbah, mm -hmm. allowing a nasiha from women also to be heard and beamed on Zoom. 
and suddenly we're getting insights that we didn't have before. And so inshallah, I think may this rupture bring such good things um, into our society. Okay, we've got a question from, oh, Sidi 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 Yeah, I just want to add, you know, uh, one of the ironies is this, that uh, whenever people attack us for our treatment of our sisters, Mm -hmm. The first one is called the Quran, and we look at the eloquent example, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the painful reality is we marginalize them. And it is not fortuitous or by chance that the countries that are doing best in terms of the COVID are women. From which countries, right? If you look at Germany, New Zealand, Taiwan, Denmark, right? Norway. And, and what do they do? What, what have they done in their leadership? Right? They were quick to act, they trusted uh, the science, they made difficult decisions with empathy and compassion, they were prepared, they collaborated, they listened, they showed clarity. And this is the whole thing, is I think in the end, it's very, very important. The status of the woman, we all understand what it is, but I think it's important that we really ensure that we not only speak about it, it's not pure rhetoric, but it happens in the real world. Okay, we got a question from uh, Abdurrahman Raika. So uh, I'm not sure which country you're from, but I've unmuted you. So Abdurrahman Raika, Bismillah, yes. yes Would you like uh, to say which, which country you're calling from, brother? Uh, from India. From India, oh wow. Okay, go ahead. Okay, um, okay so this question is uh, specifically to um, our respected guest Ibrahim Rasul. Um, okay, um, uh, Mr. Ibrahim was speaking about, uh, you know, uh, the, the COVID-19 crisis being a rupture movement, moment, uh, you know, a watershed movement for the Muslim Ummah, it can, has the potential to be. Uh, my question is that, you know, uh, Muslim countries, uh, especially, you know, you can call it as a hangover of colonialism, are very dependent on Western nations for aid, defense, security. And I believe that this some, somewhat hampers the Muslim countries taking the initiative uh, you know, or leadership role because we find most of the Muslim countries because of their dependencies are towing their, uh, the line of Western nation as far as leadership roles are concerned. And, uh, um, you know, specifically about the younger uh, people in these countries, what avenues do they have uh, to express their leadership as, you know, leaders of the whole world, not only the Ummah, uh, wherein you have their governments towing the Western, uh, you know, line of uh, the leadership uh, of the Western countries. Oh, Abdul Rahman, thank you very much for an incisive question. And I think it's a debate rather than an answer that I want to, 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 to open up with. I'm increasingly beginning to think that this rupture that I speak about must also facilitate another inversion, a turning things upside down. Historically, the Muslim periphery, where we are minorities, where we are on the outskirts of the globe, from the Middle East, we have received our guidance, our interpretations, our fatwas, our religious edicts, our ulama, our training from the heartlands of Islam. But we are now finding that the heartlands of Islam can't teach you about living democr democratically when they are autocracies and authoritarians. They can't teach you about the new global economy if they're only selling oil. They can't teach you about rights and human rights if women are not admitted into their, um, into their societies. They can't teach you about technology if they are only consumers of technologies and not developers of technology. So I think that what the rupture could be doing is to reposition the relationship between the heartlands of Islam and the periphery. I believe this is the time for leadership from the periphery, from Muslims in the West, Muslims in Africa, Muslims in Southeast Asia, Muslims in Europe, to be able to say, let us reimagine what Islam could be like and what the Ummah could be like. To live with rights, live with democracy, live with technology, live with a theology that admits women, etc., etc. So that I think is because the nature of the states in, 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 in the heartlands of the MENA region are such that authoritarian states need the surveillance technologies, the intelligence technologies of their 
the Western um, powers, the imperialist ex-colonial powers, in order to simply stay afloat. There is no way that they can move. I end provocatively because I just want to open the debate mm -hmm. by saying that there is a triangular, um, almost alliance in the world today. I think the alliance is particularly ex accentuated by Donald Trump in the White House between American imperialism, Zionism, and sometimes I would say Wahhabism. Mm -hmm. And that triangle works for the interest of keeping the states afloat in that triangular alliance. And therefore they may have forfeited and may be unable to lead in this moment of rupture. And therefore the responsibility shifts to the Muslim masses, to the intellectuals in Islam, to particularly those in the peripheries and those who are the forces for change because they are up against the forces of the status quo. Thank you so much. That's an interesting question. I mean, you don't think with the rise of, um, you know, there's a real push now for people to, you know, um, having mobile phones and, uh, and having a certain apps to find out where the other person who has this COVID, there's going to be a, some sort of more securitization, uh, uh, more control as a result of the COVID. In, in, you're, you're saying uh, on the one hand, the, Muslim, the leaders in the West, you know, I mean, they, they, there's a possibility that it could lead to more securitization and more control as opposed to what you're saying. No, absolutely. It's a, globalization is a double-edged sword. Right. It gives mobility to capital and goods, but try to deny people mobility. Right. It has technology and everything and science, but it often comes at the expense of faith and tradition. And so this is the bigger battle. So we are fighting circles within circles. And we are fighting with double-edged swords. That same technology that can enhance the surveillance state mm -hmm. is the same technology that can connect people with other cultures, other movements, other politics, other ideas. That's what the Arab Spring showed us. Mm -hmm. And so we are all in a battle for who can harness mm -hmm. the impact of globalization for better means. Okay. Um, there's no way we can agree, shut down the internet just because it can do that, because we also want it to do this. Fantastic. Abdurrahman, is there any more questions you want or is that it? I think that was it. Okay, we're going to take the question from Bilal. Uh, before I take a question from Bilal Hassan, I've got Sheikh Nuruddin uh, Lemu from uh, Nigeria. He's got a, I would like him to bring him in as a leader uh, and to make a comment, inshallah, if you don't mind. Sheikh, uh, welcome. Salam alaikum, Ramadan Kareem. And so, if you'd like to make a comment, please, let me just unmute you. Oh, right. I thought I did. If I'm just bear with me. Okay, yes, go ahead. Oh, is it still not working? Okay, right, okay, so apologize for that. Uh, where is it? Right, it should be done now. Yes, uh, Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum and Ramadan Kareem. Uh, alaikum salam. Uh, Ambassador Rasul and uh, Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Um, I think uh, very briefly, I think for Nigeria, um, we've seen a big mix of reactions. I think COVID has been an interesting filter. And a lot of what um, the ambassador has mentioned, um, you get to see leaders who are just paralyzed, who seem to be waiting for things to get back. Um, who see the rupture as uh, just a temporary, um, you know, just a, a temporary crisis and we'll just wait for things to go back to normal and then we'll carry on and not realizing uh, we have a new norm to contend with. Uh, within the Muslim community, I think uh, what we notice is those scholars, again, uh, what Ambassador Rasul was alluding to, um, who seem to be grounded in 
maqasid of sharia qawaid and usul al fiqh these subjects related to ijtihad and juristic reasoning um, who know how to quickly adapt to a situation um, were the first to bring out the most relevant fatwas were the ones that everybody wanted to listen to so what to do about mosque lockdowns what about handshaking what about um, if we exercise social distancing in the mosques um, and what to do then and if if you didn't have a grounding in this, you would usually give an answer that ended up with more lives being lost. So it was uh, very easy to see a relevant and irrelevant uh, fatwa, fatwas that really considered the values uh, as part of their formation. Um, and you know, people who didn't know how to do these fatwas really had nothing much to say before they even understood the fatwas that were being given, new fatwas were uh, coming on the next issue of um, uh, mass burial, can't wash, uh, can't do uh, the janazah as it would usually be done, the option of cremation if necessary, uh, then eat prayers and uh, a lot of what the government was asking for. So I think what it has done, it has shown uh, we need to get the general public to know more about uh, subjects like uh, Maqasid of Sharia and the Kawaid. Um, otherwise, they get paralyzed when their favorite imams are quiet and they see new fatwas they've never heard before from people who have never been recognized. So I think we are going to see a change uh, we already are seeing a change in who's being listened to, who's the best producer of content. Uh, many of the others just share content. Um, so I think that um, that's, a, that's a positive side of this rupture and the, uh, the fact that the disruption created by COVID um, is forcing us to go online and a lot of our ulama who have not been advanced enough to go online seem to be living in the years BC, um, you know, both before COVID and really before Christ type of, uh, you know, stay with the oral tradition. And I think they are quickly becoming irrelevant as people get to hear new opinions the idea of which madhab you belong to, is, you know, the last strongholds of only our madhab in, in spite of the fact that the diversity of opinions is actually a big toolbox that allows us to meet the needs of a rapidly changing present. Uh, so I think, um, you know, while I very much appreciate uh, my Maliki madhab in many ways, but I also recognize its limitations in many ways too. Um, so I think this going online, hearing voices you've never heard before, uh, but also the fact that the new fatwas are packaged with greater humility than some of the older fatwas. The older fatwas were very short. They were uh, a paragraph. This is haram based on the following verses of the Quran and Hadith and that's all. But Sheikh Lebo, do we need fatwas? Do we really need fatwas? Are, do we sometimes overrate the um, significance of our imams? You know, um, we're just playing into their, uh, you know, sentiments. I think in every field you would need to hear what the experts say, whether it's right. medicine, whether it's pandemics, whether it's law. And so we definitely can't take it away from the experts. Uh, I think we need to know who to listen to. Mm -hmm. I think uh, to your question, the big challenge is many Muslims seem to be like, forgive my language, um, villagers in Nigeria, let me say, who go to the hospital and anybody wearing a lab coat and a stethoscope is a doctor and will, doesn't mind taking his pregnant wife to see a dentist. So long as he's called a sheikh or the community <laughs> has called him a sheikh, he's got about the top 10 du'as and can do a little Arabic, a little charisma on his side. So I think it's, um, you know, they say in the country of the blind, the one-eyed is king only yep. because the blind have not been able to distinguish between the one-eyed and the two-eyed. 
So I think if we bring that minimum level up, and the, I think Makasid and Kawaida are easy to learn, they are less complicated than Usul, mm -hmm. uh, I think that critical financial, uh, sorry, critical religious literacy allows people to open their eyes a little bit mm -hmm. and hopefully uh, distinguish between the one-eyed and the two-eyed. Fantastic. Uh, Ibrahim, would you like to reflect on that, on some of the things uh, uh, Sheikh Lemus said? I only endorse it. I think we'd be wasting time and words to, to restate what the Sheikh has said eloquently. No, I think that um, the, the insight is that um, the expertise field is broadened today. So <laughs> fatawa, which were fiki ones before, are now going to enter the domain of other disciplines um, as well and be admitted as part of the knowledge base of Islam as it was in its golden age. So I, I, I think that that is an absolutely critical um, insight that we've got to learn. Okay, so moving forward, I mean, obviously we've only got about less than a couple, uh, 10 minutes for you um, because of the iftar time. What, what are the takeaways? What are you suggesting now moving forward? What, I mean, these are very inspirational. What are tangible things can we do? I mean, if you look at the West, they have leadership programs. If you look at China, they have leadership programs. They have got diplomats coming out, making the decisions. What do we have as a normal? We can't even get, we don't even have a think tank, research center. We can't even pay our thinkers, let alone, and then here we are talking about leadership, you know, going on about how we're going to rescue the Ummah, blah, blah, blah. Can, can, can I say, Mizan, that, mm. you know, this movie has played before. In right. Islam. I trace the original rapture or the original interregnum which is a pause in history, a moment of transition, a watershed in history. The original one in Islam happened seven years before the Hijra. Mm -hmm. When the ayah came down, Ghulibati Rome, Rome has been defeated. At that point, the two superpowers of the time, Persia and Rome, had fought each other to a standstill. They needed to retreat to their capitals, replenish their armies, get new leadership, recruit new soldiers, fill up the fiscus. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals this surah to Rum mm -hmm. and says this. This is, a, and holds out the promise, A, Rome will be victorious again, and B, the believers will be very happy. Holds out that promise. And in the next nine years, a makeover happens. And we must find today's equivalent Mm -hmm. for what happened then in that nine years. So it's not about, we'll have a comment from Humera saying, it's not about leadership programs. There are already too many. It's about doing better research and understanding of what we are dealing with, then to sponsor the right kind of people on the front line. Most importantly, to make our faith relevant to context. I think it's a redefinition of leadership. Right. Mm. It, it's how we, how we train leaders mm -hmm. um, for, this, for this ummah and how we use this interregnum or this moment of rapture we've got to still absorb some punishment as the early muslims did right. we've got to seek alliances with across the board as the prophet salam did yeah. rebuffed at taif but striking it well in, in but that in, requires training that requires deep training that requires resources you can't expect someone to all of a sudden okay yeah let's let's do this let's do that i mean you've no, got to train people up right the kind of training because you are doing an extraction while you are doing an insertion. You are extracting your fear of reaching out to non-Islam. Right. And you are inserting a confidence, as the Mufti from Dioban said, inserting a confidence that my faith is so great, I don't mind meeting with anyone as that generation in South Africa did when it joined the UDF and the interfaith movement. It didn't fear that its faith would be shakable. Um, and so I think it's a complete reorientation. It's a charter of Medina mm -hmm. that even includes your strategic enemy, mm -hmm. the Munafiqeen and the Mushrikeen, mm -hmm. and says we are all one polity, right. one city-state. It's one that um, is able to do all of that um, at the same time. And so we need to find today's equivalences. It's going to be mm -hmm. in the kind of courses that we do mm -hmm. that deconstructs and reconstructs at the same time. It's not your 
your, your, your usual madrasas that can do these kind of things because sometimes orthodoxy can only confirm what it already knows. We need people to transgress those boundaries and root it in the Maqasid Sharia as um, Sheikh Nuruddin um, had told us. Okay, I want to bring Sidi Idris here because we've got about 10 minutes before uh, we're going to finish up. But you run these workshops right, all around the world. Dynamics of public speaking, the making of a leader, entrepreneurship, post-COVID, dynamics of parenting, marriage. Very quickly, you know, why do we need dynamics of public speaking? What's wrong with our leaders? I mean, we say as it is, and isn't it, isn't it good enough? You know, and for me, uh, there the are two fundamental things. Uh, I regard, you know, there are different types of leadership programs, but it's not something that you foist upon people. It's very, very critical that we are able to identify the right kind of people uh, to engage in these programs. I found the almost the shortest cut to dynamic uh, leadership is when you are able uh, to help young people or anyone for the matter to hone his public speaking skills. The ability uh, uh, to articulate ideas and the ability uh, to envision things, the ability uh, to be a storyteller, a raconteur, and what will happen, it will force uh, upon them the whole idea that they need to become avid readers. And you find that great public speakers whose character is also critical. You cannot only talk about the skill. The critical thing in leadership is also character. This is something that we, we see uh, so beautifully in our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I found that public speaking is something that gives people confidence. It helps them the self-esteem. It can also help them uh, develop the emotional intelligence, which is also very, very critical. So they're able to relate to people, motivate others and motivate themselves. So you, you don't think that the Muslims are emotionally mature, you know, uh, as a general? I mean, they're, no, they're, 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 go ahead. No, no, when I speak What do you mean by emotional intelligence? Okay, when I speak about emotional intelligence, we often uh, use these terms, and I'll just give you uh, quickly uh, two examples. Emotional intelligence basically is the fact that all of us are subject to different emotions. It's how we deal with those emotions, number one. The secondly, it's not only about your emotions, also understanding the emotions of the other. And the whole idea, the person with high emotional intelligence, he does not suffer a meltdown. He's able to pick himself up or herself up and realize it's not the end in the road, but the bed in the road. To give you one beautiful example, there's an example of uh, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when a very, very poor man gave him a bunch of grapes and he was sitting amongst the Sahaba and he, he took uh, one grape, he took the other and he finished the whole bunch. The Sahaba was surprised that he never shared that uh, with them. And the old man was very happy seeing Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam enjoying the grapes. He said, oh, Prophet of Allah, it's so unlike you not to share. What happened? He said, well, when I had the first grape, it was sour. And my fear was that if I had given it to you, you might have shown your displeasure and you might have hurt his feelings. So the whole idea is about the biggest other dynamic missing is if you want leaders, you must have leaders that have high emotional intelligence, the capacity to motivate, the capacity not to take things personally, the people that are optimistic. And it's a very, very important thing. And it's something that can be learned. And coming back to the other point that was made by uh, Sheikh Nuruddin and uh, Ibrahim Rasul, I think, you know, for me, I think it's very, very important it's very critical for us to understand the following, that this, although it looks gloom out there, it's people are pessimistic, I really believe it is a tremendous potential for us to look at leadership, a potential for us to charter a new path, an opportunity Allah has given us to confront our true selves because we cannot continue to do the same things that we have done because you have the same results. Okay, we've got a question from uh, Dr. I uh, Sister Aisha Saeed, who is a, a, a leader from uh, Pakistan. She's, um, um, uh, uh, she's wants to talk about a woman's leadership development program that's going to be launched in Pakistan. Any guidelines? So Aisha, bismillah, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I was just thinking that there's a women leadership development program to be launched in Pakistan at state level. 
if you could give us any guidelines or advice or materials for referral for research. And also, much as we all aspire to become leaders and imams that we are assigned to become in Quran and Sunnah, in this uh, changing world where the shift is going to be towards IT and a VR and AI, um, we have to adjust to this new normal. Are we really equipped and prepared? Do we have the skills to become the leaders of a high-tech world? These are things that need to be thought about as well. No, inshallah, the uh, sister, if you could uh, uh, contact uh, uh, Mizan and he could give you my email, I would share with you, I've got about 10 modules of leadership and it may be relevant, you could use it, inshallah. But in terms of whether we are prepared or not, I think, you know, the important thing is this, as a woman, we must also empower ourselves. One of the things that I often speak about, it worries me, is the fact that in the first ayat to be revealed was Ikra, yet many of us do not read. We must start encouraging reading, start encouraging the whole idea of research. And inshallah, I have no, uh, uh, I can say with confidence, inshallah, that uh, all of us will be able to catch up and, and overtake, really. It's, and I'm so glad you're doing it, and uh, Allah bless you for this particular initiative. You know. Uh, Ibrahim, would you like to comment on the uh, Women's Leadership Development Program that's going to be launched in Pakistan? Any guidelines, advice, materials for research? Aisha's quite involved in the leadership in Pakistan. I think that, I think it, it, it's encouraging that these things are emerging. It will be discouraging if they emerge simply as mirror images of what has gone before. You've had a sheikh here, now you've got a sheikh there. You've had fiqh there, now you've got fiqh there. I think if we are going to create a next generation of leadership and we have new initiatives, not ones weighed down by history, but we have new initiatives, let's use the freshness of the rupture to be able to think de novo, completely new about how it is. Let's make it Makar City based. Let's make it interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. Well, you could Let's, say the same thing about MBS, right? I mean, he's being multidisciplinary. He's being maqasid, you know, Muhammad bin Salam. He's being very liberal, you know? Yeah, no, I think, I think that that may be true. But I think that we've got to distinguish between what is the domain of the status of the, um, of the forces of the status quo and what is the forces for change. Right. And that's the kind of key um, distinguishing feature of the post-COVID world. I think those, as Sheikh Nuruddin has said, those who are rooted in the old have become irrelevant during the period of crisis. Those who anticipate the new have suddenly found themselves emerging. And so, inshallah, I would suggest that we must do these kind of courses, but let's pause to think how can we do it in a way that is good, sustainable, anticipating the future and not holding on to what is past? But Mizan, if I could end by saying, yes, you have, yeah. I, at this point, inshallah, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you. It was wonderful hearing Sheikh Nuruddin. It was intimidating um, speaking with Sheikh Idris, but <laughs> it's been absolutely stimulating to be part of this program. Just Alhamdulillah, thank you. Very much. You've got to go and break your fast. Make dua for us whilst you break your fast, okay. inshallah. Oh, thanks, uh, we, we're, going to well. we're going to continue with um, uh, Sidi Idris and, uh, and we've got Sheikh Nuruddin as well. So we've got, so we've got another question. Um, let me just get this question from uh, Bilal. Bilal from, I think he's in the UK. Bilal Hassab. Bismillah, Bilal. Go ahead. Welcome. Assalamu alaikum. I thought I put my video on. Um, nice to see you, uh, Sheikh Nuruddin, and uh, my uncle Idris. Um, I, um, I mean, the, 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 there was a discussion a little bit earlier, which sort of I want to chime in on. But um, you know, when we approach um, making a change in, in any sort of leadership uh, position, especially vis-a-vis -vis wider society, we engage the media, we engage government. Um, it's almost inevitable that uh, Muslim activists will be labeled a sellout. Um, you know, there's someone who's compromised on their values. How can you sit with this Zionist? How can you sit with this, uh, you know, shaitan leadership guy? Uh, you know, how dare you work with the, the, the foreign office or Boris Johnson or Donald Trump, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's, there's always a sort of tension, especially I see amongst younger people 
who want to engage, who are told to engage, who are instructed, look, you have to transform the world, blah, blah, blah. But as soon as they operate on the inside or, or try to make influence on the inside, you know, that requires you to be politically adept. It requires you to be, uh, uh, to make um, sort of uh, decisions on your positions in, in the positions you make in public vis-a-vis uh, -vis what your faith might hold. Um, they're immediately cut down by the very communities that they emerge from. I'll give you an example of that is the mayor of London, for example, as a, as a, as a, a really iconic example of a practicing Muslim who prays five times a day, who fasts, who's gone for Hajj. Um, and yet in his role as a mayor, he, for example, has to champion the gay parade. And as a result, you'll see large swathes of the Muslim community say, how dare you call this man a Muslim? He's waving the gay flag. He's, he's uh, supporting uh, you know, businesses that uh, run and sell alcohol, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a real tension between balancing. Yeah, subhanallah, that's my question. You know, how do we... How do we um, uh, uh, navigate that tension and secondly how do we deal with the uh, backlash and I'm sure you've had it in your life plenty of times both of you uh, Sheikh Idris and uh, Sheikh Noor um, you know being being labeled uh, a sellout or being labeled as someone who's uh, not living to the values of the faith. Thank you Bilal I appreciate that we've got another we'll take another question from Hassan uh, Hassan Abedin from who's also rep uh, if I remember Hassan you're representing the OIC as well aren't you? Yeah. Well, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Thank you so much, Sheikh Idris and Nuruddin, and uh, to all the participants who have uh, been part of this wonderful discussion. Um, sorry that uh, we had uh, Brother Ibrahim had to leave, but we understand that he needs to do his duty and break his fast. Um, uh, th there are so many things that, that you have stimulated in this discussion, uh, Sheikh Idris and uh, Sheikh Nuruddin. I wanted to thank you for that um, and remind us that uh, we have been through this before in some uh, similar way. I think it, Brother Ibrahim alluded to this before, that uh, through this crisis of COVID, the whole community is under the microscope. Uh, it has been shocked uh, at its root at many levels. Um, in, a, in a way similar to, not exactly the same, but similar to what happened after 9-11, uh, when suddenly the world's microscope was on the Muslim community and we were ourselves trying to understand who, who speaks for us. And this whole question, who speaks for Islam, became one of the narratives that was in the public discourse. Uh, and suddenly on the televisions and on the news programs, there were these experts who were suddenly experts on Islam in the Middle East. We didn't know who these people were. And we looked in the biography and most of them were uh, former commentators on the Soviet Union and uh, the Cold War. And now they are suddenly experts on Islam and Middle East studies. And uh, we were shocked to find that the whole industry had been created. And in fact, careers were made uh, by these uh, sort of one day experts, armchair ulama and armchair commentators who became uh, is sensations, uh, and some of them are still around. Uh, who have uh, many have passed and gone through the phases of history, and I think in a way we have to learn the lesson of that, um, and anticipate what might happen in the coming months uh, uh, and years ahead. We know that there will be many programs that uh, governments will launch to try to address this, uh, uh, you know, and appoint uh, sort of. Uh, czars or leaders who will lead these and the money will be, uh, funds will be allocated like Prevent and like uh, so many other initiatives that were launched uh, in various countries to deal with the problem. Um, but for us as Muslims, as believers, you know, we always rely on the, the eternal message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the guidance in the Quran and the, and the lessons of the life lived by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we look at the long game, we look beyond and we should be we should be thinking in decades and centuries, almost like the Chinese do. I mean, they are a sense of better civilizational example for us than perhaps the West, which is very recent and new, 300 years maybe. The Chinese are thousands of years. They think in these terms. And maybe we should take a page out of that lesson. Uh, one of the comments was, or questions was earlier, that we are, the Muslim world is obsessed with the West mm -hmm. and we take our, our, our leadership guidance from them. And you're right, we have started to, in our leadership programs, look at how the West has been successful by being integrating in, in the community, by having civil society engagement, and we should do that. But there are also other examples for us to follow. 
um, uh, examples in the east and examples in the south and in the west from the continent of Africa itself. There are so many examples and I'm so pleased that Sheikh Idris and Sheikh Nordin are here because your countries and communities offer so much rich uh, diversity because it's actually in the African communities of the world, in African continent, where diversity has long existed. I mean, Europe is only a recent, uh, you know, participant or has recently come to accept diversity. For centuries, Catholics and Protestants fought each other. Their intolerance was the norm in Europe. But it is in Africa where you've had so many uh, cultures, languages, linguistic groups living together that you've had to accept diversity. You have actually more to offer. Uh, than we often uh, appreciate or recognize. Exactly. And my question is, how can we take advantage of those experiences, find channels for those uh, rich traditions to be more well-known among our Muslim community? I mean, we have a lot of youth who Brilliant want to be question. in the West. Can we find ways to join forces or become more aware and knowledgeable about that? Because mm -hmm. you really have so much more for us to learn from an offer and Jazakumullah khair for the offer. That's a brilliant question, Hassan. Um, Idris, do you want to quickly comment and maybe we can get something from uh, Sheikh Nuruddin? Yeah, you see the... What South Bilal's, African experience, yeah. Bil yeah, no, respond to Bilal, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> what Bilal is speaking about is a real challenge. It happens everywhere. You, you know, in the sense that uh, you, are, you have a noble intention, you want to do something for the community, and it serves the community. And I think the bottom line is this, that often the detractors are a vociferous minority. They might have some influence, but we must continue to do what is right and try to get as many people around you to support your initiatives. Sometimes, you know, as a fraternity, people might uh, speak with one voice, but when you speak to them as individuals, many of them are very, very sympathetic. It's, it's a kind of challenge people go through everywhere, right? And it's something that we've got to contend with, right? Now, the, in terms of uh, our own experiences in South Africa, you know, Alhamdulillah, we are very, very blessed in the sense that uh, we are allowed to speak freely, we are allowed to be, we support the Palestinian program. The government is also sympathetic. Lots of things are happening. But, but you didn't have that, though. You didn't. You, it was an iteration. You had to go through some issues, yeah, right? yeah, 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 it is. Yes, of course. But the whole thing is this, that the people that fought in the struggle to liberate South Africa, all of them, uh, I think, without exception, support also the Palestinian uh, uh, program. But for us, I mean, coming back to this whole uh, COVID uh, lockdown thing, I think it's a great opportunity uh, for new leadership uh, to emerge, or if, that, if there was uh, any other leadership that perhaps was paralyzed, whatever, out of fear, whatever else, they, it can be resuscitated. And it's an opportune time for us to do that, an opportune time to relook at our, all our institutions to see how we can reinvigorate it, revitalize it, so that we uh, have, so that everyone becomes ambassadors uh, for humanity, for Islam, uh, without even speaking, but just through our action. You know. Fantastic. And can I re recommend folks, please, please sign up to Sidi Idrisi's workshops. I'm going to quickly, before I get to Sheikh Nuruddin, can I request Sister Humera who wants to respond to uh, Bilal? Bismillah, Sister Humera. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, Azan, and Assalamu alaikum, Idris. And, uh, oh, Islam. Oh, Humera. Nice to see you. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you for this conversation and I think I have really, uh, these are the questions that I have been thinking about a lot uh, over 30 years, but in particularly since this lockdown and, and I'm really happy that you've been addressing both of you some of the really pertinent issues. Uh, but I just really wanted to respond to what Bilal was saying is about when a leadership does uh, emerge that they get slated and I think um, uh, I would like to disagree with him on that because I think that there is a certain arrogance uh, in many of the people who emerge as leadership because uh, they sort of think uh, people have a duty to listen to me, right? And people are not doing the work on the ground. I can't think of any other community where their leadership uh, has not gone through the ropes all of these leaders of the church and the Jewish uh, communities, they do their grassroots, they do their work on the ground, they, they're totally connected to regular people all the time. There's not a disconnect, right? So a lot of our leaderships maybe have something to say, 
but they are not dis they're not connected to the process. In the early 90s, we did, on this society, the organization yes, I'm part of, we did a conference where nobody was talking about it, about child sexual abuse in the Muslim community. Yes. We got the late Dr. Dash speaking at it. We didn't get an uproar at all from the community because we are with the community, we work with them and we're sensitized to them. Mm -hmm. If you then come, as some of our political leaders have been in Britain, for example, criticize the community endlessly, tell them, get your act together, do the da, da but you don't offer anything and you're not standing side by side with them, why should anybody listen to you, Point. right? You haven't come uh, with the right credentials to be heard. Prophets themselves came with the credentials and even they weren't heard, but they had the right credentials so that uh, they could create the arena to be heard. And so why do our leadership think that they are any better than prophets, right? Uh, and uh, just to conclude with what I said earlier, mm -hmm. really the future, the future is that we as men and women have to talk together, right? Uh, and, uh, and I think that still so much of the leadership is so male orientated uh, and, uh, you know, uh, there has to be a stepping up and giving space. And I, I agree with what was said. Mm -hmm. I think Ibrahim said it, uh, or if, I can't remember who said it. We don't want a mirroring of a bad leadership. We don't That's want good. women to be equally as bad as the men. Mm -hmm. So women have to up the ante as well. And we have to be different. And we have to be different together. A bit like Ertugal, like the uh, ringtone on your phone, right? We've got to be exactly. like that. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Okay, so look, Sheikh Nuruddin, uh, you, you can respond to uh, uh, Sheikh Hassan, Sidi Idris, any of you folks. Bismillah. Um, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Humera. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. I think um, to the three, both Bilal Has uh, Hassan and Sister Humera, um, it is true, you know, there's this saying that to travel far, you go with others. To travel fast, you go alone. And we've seen it both with imams, um, political leaders. When dealing with the Muslim community, sometimes they go fast without taking others along. And I think I would move a bit into uh, some of the point that uh, Sister Humaira made without being judgmental uh, on the side of the uh, mayor. But we've noticed here in Nigeria, um, uh, when people are really ignorant about some of the very basics of Islam, they become a big problem, whatever their good intentions are. So say, for example, um, uh, Muslim leadership uh, working with non-Muslim leadership. It may be gay group, it may be this or that. But we have precedents in Sharia of a king, Yusuf, who worked with a non-Muslim king towards greater food security in Egypt. We had a Muslim prophet, Musa alayhi salam, discussing, negotiating with somebody as bad as Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. We had the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam going into a negotiation with the uh, mushrikun uh, of Mecca in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah mm -hmm. and settling on a deal that was not in the short term uh, favorable to Muslims. It was one where most of the Sahaba were actually very disappointed with the Prophet. Right. So the question of Muslims working with non-Muslim leaderships for greater peace, choosing lesser evils is nothing new. Mm -hmm. What I think we find uh, very useful here is, uh, and you find this even in the books of Fiqh when it comes to uh, what they call the Darul Sulh or Darul Ahad, where we need to have concessions like in many countries, Nigeria. Uh, not everything in the constitution is what Muslims would like, However, this is a constitution that gives us peace. We're not fighting over ethnicity or religion or region, uh, et cetera. So what we have found useful here has been to conduct training the trainers courses for mm -hmm. religious actors, for religious leaders, and those who are going to be our critics if we were to engage uh, with the leadership for one reason or another. Because and once do you those, do get, those courses have any uh, skills based stuff like what Idris is doing, or is it just theoretical? Maqasid, this, these are the Maqasids, this is what you need to do. Or is there any uh, real skills based stuff, communication or management? Yeah, we've got a whole package, mm -hmm. but the one we call it Sharia intelligence, which right. is really simplifying applied 
usul al-fiqh, qawaid al-fiqhiyah, and maqasid sharia, which are the classical faith-based critical thinking tools of Islamic jurisprudence that allow us to navigate uh, and weigh the strength and relevance of fatwas. So what we found is, as people go through these courses, they become more respectful, not just tolerant of diversity, but see why diversity has been, is, and will continue to be part and parcel of uh, the Islamic discourse, and why we must learn to agree to disagree agreeably. So definitely, we need to go beyond the top-down uh, approaches. We need to learn how to live and thrive with diversity. But um, I think the more, so to answer your question on the question of like the skill side, what we do is go through a lot of case studies, those issues that debates exist on, those issues that extremists sometimes bring, uh, and look at how to apply it to those contexts so that people calm down uh, more and respect the diversity and not make a bad situation even worse or miss out on a potential opportunity. Amazing. Uh, uh, Sidi Dries, any, any comments you want to make? I mean, it's interesting. There's a lot of similarities. Yeah. Some of the workshops you've done on, you know, uh, uh, communication, leadership management, uh, parenting. I mean, sometimes, you know, you know, some of the leaders we have, like, you know, we had Gaddafi and uh, Saddam. I mean, you can do a lot of the a lot of the things you can trace back to their family roots. They've they've had really poor parenting, right? They've really had poor families right from the start. Uh, is there some truth in some of the stuff you're doing with family and parenting courses? You know, firstly, I must uh, <coughs> commend uh, Nuruddin. He's doing great work, and I'm so happy to see my sister Umera there. Right, Alhamdulillah. So the the whole thing is this: uh, I found the following that. In many cases, when I deal with uh, family issues, when I deal with young boys and girls becoming delinquents, there's a condition that is called post-traumatic stress. It is their life experiences that really impacts the way they see the world. And they carry that baggage with them. And it impacts the way they look at people, whether they are uh, pessimistic, whether they have a victim mentality. So the upbringing is a very, very critical aspect in terms of the stability. So it's very, very important for us uh, to give our children a lot of love, develop the self-esteem, develop the emotional intelligence, make them creative, hug them, celebrate them. I'm not saying you must be indulgent. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is you also teach them consequences for good behavior and their negative consequences for negative behavior. And you know what, and coming back to this whole overarching theme about the lockdown, I think it's very, very critical. It'd be very, very sad that we have participated in this interactive thing. We go back either not honing our skills or not looking at what should be some of the solutions. So it's a gift to us, uh, which I want to say. And also, I think it's very, very important that we participate in the community so that, inshallah, the ummah, inshallah, will be healed mm -hmm. before it's able to make progress. Fantastic. We're coming to the end now. So, folks, if you want to take advantage of uh, uh, some of the workshops, uh, Sidi Dries is running a number of workshops on Zoom coming up. Um, leave your email address here on the chat. And if you want to invite them, both uh, Ibrahim Rasul and, uh, and Sheikh Nuruddin, please don't hesitate, contact us. And I'm sure they'll be more than happy to go to your countries and deliver workshops uh, as well. So we're coming to the end. Uh, we'd like to thank everyone. This is, has been recorded. So leave your email addresses. I know there's quite a few more questions. Um, it's only fair that Idris and um, uh, Ibrahim go and finish their fast. I mean, finish the, have have the iftar and a bit more food and you know, they must be really tired but uh, we will be sending the recording if you haven't left your email address please leave me your address on the chat and we'll send that over uh, can i request Sheikh Nuruddin, i'm going to be in contact with you because we're going to be having more sessions anyway we need to touch base on the whole west african experience of leadership especially i'm going to i'm going to bring up the thing with regards to um, amir sanusi you talk about leadership i i thought he was a good man and then where happened Nigerian politics came in, right? Okay, we need to touch base in regards to that. But uh, Sheikh Hassan, thank you so much for a wonderful question. And we're going to be touching base as well from your experiences with regards to the OIC as well, try and get something going. But I think most important takeaways right now would be, look, look, um, 
we do have a leadership crisis, but at the same time, these are great opportunities uh, to really invest right now uh, and to build new leadership, new leadership programs. And maybe who knows, in 50 years time, 100 years time, we'll have some great new leaders, inshallah. So finally, I'd like to thank all our speakers, Sidi Idris, thank you so much. Uh, Sheikh Nuruddin, I know it was a last minute.com sort of invite, but it's always best to get, it's always best like that sometimes, you know, it always works. My pleasure. Uh, My pleasure. And also, Sister uh, Humera, thank you so much uh, for uh, asking those difficult questions and responses and hope everyone's questions have been answered. I know still emails coming through, but we have to end right now. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Um, tomorrow's program is with Sheikh uh, Mustafa Abu Sway, who is the uh, uh, chair of the Ghazali Saad Masjid Al-Aqsa. Saturday, we have uh, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad. He's going to be talking about his new book, uh, European Traveller. On Sunday, we have Professor Wail Halak. He's going to be talking about Taha Abdul Rahman. So we're going to be uh, looking at non Following that, we're gonna, we've got Professor Ziauddin Saddar, who's going to be talking about Islamization of, uh, of new knowledge, of his new book as well. So we've got a number of high-profile speakers uh, on our thing. And on Friday, um, next Friday, uh, it's a joint program with the AKP uh, UK branch. We have Professor, um, oh, what's it? The, the senior advisor to the president of Turkey. Sorry, my mind's gone at the moment, but I'm sure I'll, I'll send it to you, the folks, uh, on the email coming up so without further ado take care assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh